All right. Well, welcome everyone tonight to our Kubernetes meetup. Uh, we're grateful to have a, a great speaker all the way from New Zealand. No, he's not in town. He's, he's literally um, presenting from New Zealand. Um, but we really appreciate uh, Craig uh, presenting tonight. Um, security is always an interesting thing, especially uh, out of the box, which is not always the best way to start. But uh, we're looking forward to hear from you and some of the things that you've been working on. And I'll just I'll just turn back over to you, uh, Craig, and, and you can kind of introduce yourself, your background, and kind of uh, take it from there. And then uh, I did want to ask you, we often have, of course, we're not in person, but we do have people that do, may have questions. Didn't know if you wanted to do it at the end or during your presentation. I can monitor moderate some of those in the chat. Uh, what would you prefer? I'm happy to do either way. I'd love just to have a chance, obviously. Uh, it's easier with us all being remote than if you were all in a room. I was a bit worried I was going to be talking to a wall, but uh, I, I like to have people keep their mics on and, and respond to things. There will be a bit of audience participation required, at least at one point. So okay, please awesome. feel free to jump in. OK. Well, then, take it away, then. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Paul. And thank you all for coming along tonight. Uh, I was going to say it was a shame that I flew all this way and you didn't even bother coming out to, to weave to see me, but uh, it's uh, to be expected. Um, as he mentioned, I'm in, in New Zealand. We've had a, a cyclone in the last week that basically ripped the uh, power and communication infrastructure out for a whole bunch of the, the coastal parts, the, the nicer parts of the country to some degree. Uh, it turns out that uh, I wasn't affected by that. There's a very long convoluted story as to why, but uh, basically why I live in this part of the country was because my dad moved here 35 years ago or something. And that was with his job, which was working for the National Telecommunications Company to manage their network effectively. And they decided that they would put their network management in this town because it's not on the coast, so it's not likely to get flooded and it's not on a fault line, so there's no earthquakes, there's no mountains nearby or anything. So it's by definition the most geologically boring part of the country. And that makes it a good place to repair all the rest of the country from when a cyclone runs through. So again, I understand uh, the situation with uh, not being able to get places and uh, thank you all for joining online anyway. Background, I started my career in New Zealand about 20 years ago working in small business IT. Uh, we'll get to that, Blake. <laughs> We uh, ended up uh, moving overseas, uh, which uh, most New Zealanders do, and lived in uh, Canada for a couple of years. So as I said before, I am familiar with the concept of uh, two feet of snow. Lived in Toronto for two years, which uh, measured as basically 18 months of winter and six months of habitable seasons. And then uh, moved to the UK, where I was based for about 15 years. And then the pandemic hit, and uh, we had a young son, and he hadn't met his grandparents. So he's uh, decamped back to New Zealand, which is where we're based at the moment. For most of the time I was in the UK, I was working for Google. I joined just as they were talking about the secret Project 7 thing. So we're working on open sourcing the thing that would become Kubernetes. And my role was largely going and talking at that point to our European customers and saying, hey, the, the team in the US are building this thing and we can't tell you about it, but it's going to be really cool. And you should go away and learn about Docker and see if that's something you want to investigate. But my roles there involved dealing with the European customers in the cloud native and architecture space. And then as uh, Kubernetes became more of a thing, I got more directly involved with that. So I was leading some of the go-to-market efforts, helping our sales teams and so on understand what Kubernetes was as it was coming on board, and then worked in our developer relations team for many years. I'll, I'll say not there anymore, but um, working with uh, Kubernetes and GKE, and then largely focused on Istio for the last few years that I was at Google. Uh, that job brought me back over to here. And then uh, about six months ago, I decided that uh, the time was right to move to a company where it was a bit more of a startup, a bit more directly influential. It's lovely working at a big company, but you do get to the point where you think, well, it's very hard to see the work that you're doing, how it relates to the machinery of uh, AI and uh, advertising and so on, which is the, the key of the business. And it's great to be more back at the beginning of starting something new. So I went to Armo, who are a cybersecurity vendor, to help build out their open source and community relationships. They had a project which was built from the beginning to be open source, but it wasn't yet a member of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is a, a sort of expectation a lot of people have for um, for projects in this space. And I'm very happy to take questions on sort of 
CNCF and that kind of stuff, uh, we might do those at the end and maybe after the recording's turned off. So other things that uh, are useful to know about me, I'm a huge fan of the actor Burt Reynolds. I mean, who isn't really? That's a fantastic moustache. Deliverance, Smokey and the Bandit, Boogie Nights. I like to think he single-handedly started the moustache craze of the late 1970s. And uh, if you're paying a little bit of attention to uh, to what you see here, I mean, this was the, the worst day, really, September 7th, 2018. Uh, Burt Reynolds died, but uh, that's obviously not the reason that we're talking about this today. Uh, it's really a problem in the cloud security space these days to keep off the front page of the newspaper. Uh, this situation here, there was a cyber attack against British Airways. They had almost 400,000 people have their account data stolen. I was obviously so angry at BA that I moved all the way from London to New Zealand so I didn't have to fly with them ever again. And this is something that I, I'm thinking, right, is, is I'm going to start giving security presentations around the world. It, it's got to be trivial to find an example that's relevant to, to every audience that I'm speaking to. So here's the one for Utah. There's one that came up. It was very easy to search. Uh, we have a Medicaid data breach, which was caused by, quote, a mistake being that this was a mistake made in 2012. It's unlikely that there's going to have been any Kubernetes involved in this, but there have been plenty of high profile breaches that we can directly trace back to Kubernetes. One of the most famous is, of course, these guys who are a mere eight hours drive away from you, which uh, you probably can't do if you're in one of their cars. They had a Kubernetes installation which was published on the internet and they had the dashboard which had full access to run everything on the cluster and it also unfortunately published their amazon credentials so people were able to log in and access their s3 buckets and get access to their files and and then run things inside this cluster as well i don't think the people who found and exploited this knew where they were because if you were in a situation like this where you got access to a company on the scale of tesla there are probably more interesting things that you can do but instead, they did what everybody did, which is mine, Bitcoin. Now, I'm a law-abiding citizen of a first world country, so I don't really think cryptocurrency is, is something that I personally need. In fact, it, it's basically ruined the world. Perhaps they wanted to mine Bitcoin. Perhaps they just thought there's computers available. Perhaps they knew where they were and they wanted to mine enough Bitcoin they could actually buy a Tesla. But the problem is that we have this untraceable way to transfer money. And in theory, that means you have an untraceable way to pay a ransom if someone asks one of you in order to regain access to your system or the data that was stored on it. So I blame Bitcoin for the rise of the modern ransomware attack. There is now actual money that can be gained in security breaches. So there's actual industry, people sort of working in a, a shadow commercial fashion to just try and attack everything that's on the internet out there completely at random without necessarily caring who it is. I was looking at ransomware in, in order to put this together. You'd be surprised to learn that the first ransomware virus was actually developed by an evolutionary biologist who worked at Harvard. It was uh, back in the MS-DOS days. So he asked you to post a check for $189 to a post office box in Panama if you wanted to decrypt your files. True story. So IBM Research did a study and they said last year the average cost of a ransomware attack was $4.5 million. That doesn't even include the cost of the ransom. It also doesn't include the reputational cost, the fact that I'm less likely to, fly, to ever fly British Airways again or to seek healthcare in Utah. So now that gets us into what I will call the scary numbers section. All security presentations have to start with some scary numbers. There's an entire industry predicated on providing them. This is a number from Tanzu here. They say that 97% of organizations have concerns about Kubernetes security. Well, of course they do. That's People should be worried about things pretty easy to look at. Let's break it down a little bit. Red Hat did a study, and they ask of the following risks, which ones are you most worried about for your container and Kubernetes environments? And attacks, sure, people worry about that, but three times as many people are worried about misconfigurations or data exposures. And that makes sense because when you look back at what people actually reported had happened over the course of the last 12 months, misconfigurations are the most likely thing to cause people problems here. They do something like publish the Kubernetes dashboard online open to everybody without knowing it and thus give the keys to the kingdom away. 
Gartner, who by some measure are the king of scary numbers, say that 99% of breaches in 2025 are going to be traceable to customer mistakes. So it seems like we should try and find a way to not make so many mistakes. So some of you will have an inner monologue that says, I'm a developer, I don't have to think about this. I have a team of professionals whose entire job it is to ensure that I don't end up on the front page of the newspaper next to a recently deceased celebrity. We well, should go and talk to your security team because it turns out that they don't necessarily think that's what they're there for. Cloud and Kubernetes have been great at moving responsibility around the so-called shift left, as we'll see, so that developers have to do more things. They have to worry about deployment now, and of course they have to worry about security. We see people here having to move the things that they care about, ops people, not really necessarily a, a function anymore, but just a, a thing that people do as part of the process. Good organizations hopefully have the same team with incentives aligned so that they're able to deploy software and then also maintain it through its life cycle. Some people call it DevSecOps. I'm basically just going to call it extra work that has to be done. Developers and DevOps teams, if they're separate things, now need to care about security. Maybe you're not as afraid of the front page of the newspaper as me. Well, half of the people that Red Hat surveyed said that security got in the way of them deploying at the speed that they wanted to work at. So if you have to worry about security, it will slow you down. And it will also cost you money. We talked about ransomware, but let's just look at the cost of fixing a defect. There is a book by a guy called Capers Jones, which uh, is sort of the standard uh, way of measuring a lot of things in software. And his estimate is that a defect is around 650 times cheaper to fix if you pick it up in the development phase than if you if you have to fix that same thing in production. So, scary number section over. What is it that we really have to worry about? Well, I say that there's a... Uh, a theory here, you can think of it as a joke or a proverb, depending on the point of view. It's the, the outrunning the bear security theory. You may have heard the joke. If you haven't, I'll repeat it to you. There's uh, two people camping in the woods somewhere, and uh, a bear comes upon their tent. And the first one starts strapping on their running shoes. Second one turns and says, what are you going? What are you putting them on for? There's no way you're going to outrun the bear. And the first one says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. Unless you've attracted the attention of a nation state that's willing to burn a zero day exploit on you, I think that you're more likely to fall prey to someone who's randomly scanning the internet looking for open MongoDB ports or instances of the old Kubernetes dashboard. There are a set of security vulnerabilities that you absolutely have to be aware of, and then there are probably diminishing returns after that point. You get to the point where you can be overwhelmed if you look at the output of security tools and it says, well, all these things are wrong. Say, well, you can spend your lifetime trying to fix all those things, or you can look for a way to prioritize which ones are most important and most relevant to you. Let's have a look at how the Kubernetes documentation talks about security. They have this model which they call the four Cs. They all build on each other in a very specific fashion. We have code, we have the container, we have the cluster, and we have the cloud. If the cloud is compromised, there's no amount of security that you can add to your code in order to help protect you. But there is a break between the cloud and the thing that's above it. Your cloud security system might be aware it's got VMs running, but unless it is somehow aware of Kubernetes and the workload, there's effectively a second cloud running on top of it. It alone isn't going to be able to help tell what's going on inside your cluster environment. It's just going to say there is something running there. But we are going to trust that there's some outsourcing arrangement and cloud you can think of as colo or your servers or so on if, if you're running in-house. But ultimately, we're running this thing on top where we have to think about, in a different hierarchy, the security of. Now, there have been many, many books written on how to write good code. There's a sea change happening in the industry in terms of things like memory safe languages, which we can glibly summarize like this. But ultimately, you're going to have to do a bunch of your own work 
to make sure that the software is secure. And I can't advise you here what the best thing to do in that way is, but there is a lot of literature out there depending on, on what it is that you're running, how you're dealing with it. Next, let's talk about software supply chain. And when we ask what this is, say it's kind of the gaps between the boxes. What is the process by which your code is taken and then made into a container? And then what is the process by which your container is taken and instantiated to run in a cluster? There is a whole bunch of work that's happening here. This is one of those things I say that if you feel that you've got all the rest of the basics down and you know what you're doing, then it's clearly the right time to start looking at software supply chain attacks. But in the outrunning the bear theory, they are more likely to affect people who are being targeted specifically. And so I would encourage you to, to look into other things before you start worrying about do you have S bombs and everything built for every piece of code that you're deploying. And hopefully we as an industry are getting to that point. We can expect that that will be built into more of the package software that we take and more of the tools that we have will automatically handle deploying this. So we know what our dependencies are and we know if there's a vulnerability in one of them at any point that we need to go back and look at it. So back to our four C's, we've kind of moved cloud and code to the side. So now we're going to talk about basically what we're going to run and how we're going to run it. What we're going to run, reasonably self-explanatory. Code has dependencies. As I say, those dependencies have occasional vulnerabilities. They are documented on a thing called the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures List, CVE. And you have coordinated disclosure with the teams, people who find the issue, the people who make the software, and then the nonprofit who look after that database in order to publish these things in a safe fashion. The CVE database is maintained by an organization called MITRE. MITRE was launched by the US Air Force in 1958. No one ever really talks about why it has its name. I looked this up as well. So the team of directors who set the thing up were from MIT, and so they opened the dictionary at that page and looked for a random word. They liked the look of the word MITRE, which uh, refers to either a joint between two pieces of wood or a bishop's hat. There you go. Knowledge bomb for today. So we've got our what we're going to run, which is our container and the code that's packaged up into it. And let's look then at the how we're going to run it. We have a cluster. And we have, in the case of Kubernetes, a set of instructions, a manifest file that talk about how we need to run this in a way that the cluster can consume and keep up for us. So microphones on, this is the audience participation point. This is uh, from a blog post that was published in January. It's called the YAML document from hell. Something is wrong with every single stanza that you see here. I'd like anyone who can note any of them to call out and see if there's anything that they can see as to what might be a problem with any of these things. I think the first one, it gets converted into some weird non-decimal number. <laughs> That's correct. So the first stanza port mapping there, you'll see one of them is 22 to 22. It interprets that as 22 minutes past 10 p.m. in the evening is a base 60 number. And then that actually works out to the number 1362 or something like that. So when that gets parsed into the application, it is no longer a string with pairs. You have to wrap those kind of things in quotes or they won't necessarily do what you want. So that is good. We're one for five so far. Anyone else got any guesses as to what might be wrong with any of these? So the third one's pretty easy. You've probably heard of that one before. Yeah, that no is actually a Boolean. So it won't come out to the string no. That is correct. That again will be parsed as false. The string no, yes and no parsed to true and false by most YAML parsers. Yeah. Although I believe that uh, some of these things here uh, again, depending on the version. So YAML is actually versioned. Uh, but between version 1.1 and 1.2, I think they may have realized that some of these things are not commonly looked at the way that one would expect. And so the standard says one thing, but uh, common implementations may in fact do other things. But again, remember to put everything in quotes. Very important. Also, things are generally opt-in or opt-out, and I'm not quite sure what that second block is. Yeah, so the, the second block, um, this is one I, I had no idea about at all. Apparently, uh, stars and exclamation marks have meanings in YAML. They're basically stars are sort of an anchor that defines a, a heading like you would with an href in HTML. And uh, the exclamation point is a reference to that, perhaps like you would with a, a markdown heading. So both of those asterisk lines will just disappear completely. 
Hmm. And uh, eventually, so will the third one. So you'll only end up with those two strings again if you don't remember to put things in quotes. Uh, we did no for the number three. That's easy. Uh, on is the same for for part number four. On effectively is like on and off, true and false. YAML will interpret those as being values. And then the fifth one again. You look at the uh, numbers there. It's not just the the fact that it is a time that will cause this to parse incorrectly, but a three. So number digits dot other digits is interpreted as an integer and digit dot digit dot digit is interpreted as a string hmm. and that is not normally a problem in and of itself things should get casted to the right place but uh, you might see for example a templates that say if, if the value is greater than a certain thing or so on that you'll get weird behaviors in this case and you could imagine updating you say well i'm going to change my default value from 9.6 point something to, to 10 point something in this case and the cause of you just making that one change again is going to cause the parsing of this. So I think there's a, a general feeling that um, could everyone have gone back in time and known what was going on, that YAML may not have been the best choice for defining things for Kubernetes. But indeed, it is where we are. Uh, it is not the canonical form. Again, if, if people are asked to name the ways that you can define objects to be sent to Kubernetes, they generally come up with YAML and JSON and forget that it's all just transferred into uh, Google's protocol buffers in the background. But there's a huge spec, huge space that people can have for misconfigurations. So one of the key features of the Cloud Native Security white paper is a recommendation that uh, you should be testing in this case. It's vital to scan application manifests in your CI CD pipeline to identify configurations that could result basically in mistakes, insecure deployment posture, things not being what you expect. A linting process of some sort. That's all very well. There are a whole bunch of tools to do something like this, but it's not very helpful just to say something is wrong. If I knew something was wrong, I would have written it the right way in the right time. What I really want to be told is something is wrong. Here's why, and here's some sort of remediation, or here's how to fix it. We move on to this cloud native security white paper. Kubernetes gives us the four C's, and the CNCF paper moves up the stack a little bit and gives us four Ds. So we have develop, distribute, deploy, and uh, runtime. Sorry, that was uh, too good to be true, unfortunately. These are the phases that uh, we move our code and containers and so on through. So these here, I'm, I wasn't 100% sure whether it would be valuable to, to put these slides in. But we're working this out together, so we'll, we'll see how we feel about it. And the development phase, we're working building our... So th this isn't developing the code necessarily. This is developing the way of packaging up the code. So we're taking what we have, any manifest files we need, either for Kubernetes or for deploying Terraform files to deploy infrastructure required to run it and so on. We have our Docker files. We have manifest custom code and so on. We're going to commit them to some sort of source code. Either at that point or somewhere in our ID, we want to be able to, uh, this is like as far left as we can go, effectively. We want to be able to do security checking at this point before we move on to the integration phase, which they talk about as distribution. We're going to then build our container images and push them up to a repository somewhere. And it's at this point also that we are generally taking in other people's layers. So we might say our thing builds on top of the Ubuntu base image, and then that's going to bring in many different layers depending on the versions that we've picked up ourselves. Uh, if you're really hipster, you're building everything from scratch, but a lot of people are going to be deploying things that they haven't maintained themselves. Like you might just say, I'm bringing in the generic MySQL image that's maintained by the people who manage that these days, whether it's Oracle or someone else. Moving on, we have a deployment phase. That's effectively where our cluster can say, all right, well, are we allowed to run these particular things or not? And that's where some of the uh, supply chain stuff comes in handy, is to say we might only want to allow signed images. We might say we might only want to allow images that come from particular repositories. So in the case that someone was able to get into our cluster and they wanted to start something running, they wouldn't able to just be able to run an arbitrary container. And then we have all the things we have to worry about at the runtime phase. 
don't get too tied up with the, the number of things here. If you're involved in the Kubernetes ecosystem, you'll be familiar that it's not just Kubernetes. It's all the other bits and pieces and things that one has to worry about. And uh, my goal is to not have to think about as many of them as possible. The thing that sort of comes in from a security perspective is the part here on the right. So we have um, compliance and policies are, are, again, a thing that we may not necessarily worry about when we're developing and deploying our code, but we will have company auditors who have various standards that we want to make sure that we meet. And it's useful that this has got to the point where it has hit some of the larger nonprofit organizations in the military and so on, who are now publishing guidance on what we should be doing at that phase. So a couple of years ago now, we had the NSA and the CISA, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, who are almost the same thing, but not quite as I understand it. And this is the phase where they tend to publish guidance on how to secure a cluster. We have various things for the workloads, like we want to say, don't allow them to run as root, don't allow them to export more privileges. So if you have a process, uh, basically, it shouldn't have sudo access. It shouldn't be able to run a process with more privilege than what it is. These are things that sound like they're simple, sensible, but they're not built in. And like we can talk about how there's no such thing in Linux as a container. It's all just made up out of uh, component parts. So there are a lot of different knobs and things you need to configure in the Kubernetes environment to make it secure. There are a bunch of other things that you could do if you want to lock down further and talk about things like GVisor and, and q and if, if anyone's interested. But ultimately, it got to the point where it was useful enough to large numbers of government organizations that people started publishing guidance on what you should do to run a secure environment. There are three key areas, um, three to the groups that are looking at this. Uh, the NSA we've mentioned already. Uh, there are benchmarks now published by the Center for Internet Security. That's generally a thing that uh, it, it is a benchmark, so it's not a pass or fail in the same way that something like uh, PCI or HIPAA is. But a lot of people are starting to say, well, I want to make sure that I'm checked off against all of these things or I am validating a reason why I'm not if I'm not going to. And then we have uh, another thing from our friends at MITRE, which is uh, attack, it's pronounced, even though it has um, an ampersand in the middle. And I, I can never remember exactly what it stands for. It is an abbreviation, but effectively it's a, a way of looking at, at threats and how people can tie them together and say, if I'm able to exploit this thing, then I'm able to take a, 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 a privilege escalation and then I'm able to take an unpublished vulnerability and so on and use that to get from low privilege to high privilege inside a cluster. But they've also working with Microsoft to find a whole bunch of rules and things one should look out for that effectively are security misconfigurations that people can worry about. So that brings us to the project that I work on, which is called Cubescape. Cubescape takes the guidance from those particular people and defines some frameworks, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, that you can confer against your environment, or you can move further left and say, I'm going to use that against things in my delivery phases or even in when I'm developing the manifests and so on. It lets you take those results from those scans and upload to a, a backend and then look at the status of your cluster over time as workloads change, it lets you look at things in, in multiple different clusters. If you're saying, all right, well, I have a staging in the deployment uh, production environment, then you want to make sure that the things are the same in both of them. And then gives you advice also contextually from what you've deployed as to how you might go about fixing those things. So we want to go through and say, well, there are a bunch of vulnerabilities. There are input we're getting from CVEs and the containers that you're running. There is everything we're scanning that you're running configuration. There are things we want to look at that are about the configuration of the cluster as well. And say, all right, well, you are not meeting best practice by these standards. And there are cases where it might be that you're you've decided that as a business, you don't need that particular standard or that's a risk you're willing to take. So you might define your own framework based on some of the, the rules that are defined by these other frameworks and apply them to what makes sense for you and your developers. We have over 150 different controls that we've developed, which map against those frameworks there and also some best practices that uh, Armo have developed themselves. So let's talk a little bit about what those things mean. 
so a framework effectively is a set of guidelines or best practices or so on, but it, it's a headline category. So we treat the things we mentioned there, the, the NSA's hardening guidance, the CIS benchmarks, we treat them as frameworks. And you can say scan a cluster against that particular framework. Some of them are broken down into more specific things for various providers. So the CIS published benchmarks for Kubernetes as a whole, and then they've worked with all of the cloud providers to say, here's one that's Amazon specific, here's one that's Google specific. So we've just launched support for the uh, Amazon EKS benchmark there, and uh, we're going to do Azure and then Google very soon also. Frameworks are made up of a list of controls. Uh, there are a lot of them in the CIS benchmark. There's 212 or something like that. And basically, each one is a potential vulnerability to check. This thing shouldn't be configured in this way. Uh, question there, how is this different from Sonoboy? Sonoboy is more about how the cluster... Uh, how it's deployed it's similar i think like i don't know quite that it deals with the security of the cluster but it, Sonoboy boy definitely doesn't care about what's deployed on the cluster it basically exists to check that the cluster is compliant and that the api server runs it, it probably works in a very similar way and that it will have controls that say you must be able to submit an api object to the service and it must respond to you if it's broken it should give you a 400 error or something like that so it is a similar system that checks a different thing it definitely doesn't deal with anything about the workloads that are deployed on the cluster though as far as i understand it. and then inside the clusters we have rules basic uh, things to say this control will check vulnerability in this way and it will do this by saying is this value true false left right etc So I wasn't sure whether I would be able to do live scanning of things, whether it makes sense the presentation. So we might sort of leave the um, live interactive part to the end if we need to. But effectively, the way that most people will interact with Cubescape first is that they will go to GitHub and they will run a little command to download it locally. And then you get a binary and you can run that in your own console. It's going to run against the cluster that you have configured in your kubectl at that point in time. And then have something that looks a bit like this. So you scan it here. It will connect to your cluster. And then it will run a whole bunch of these controls and validate various things. So we can see here that running against a cluster I have in Docker Desktop, uh, there are some things here that it's a, a critical severity simply because it doesn't know what's going on. Like the NSA framework says that uh, it's critically important that you enforce kubelet client TLS authentication. And you can't tell whether or not that's happening because that's between the API server and the node. You can't actually tell unless you look at the configuration on the node. There's no way that you can look at the API server and ask whether it's configured that way. So in order to validate those kind of things, we have a separate component called the host sensor, host scanner. And that gets deployed as a daemon set when you run Kubescape, if you provide an extra configuration parameter. It takes a little bit longer to run, so we don't have that enabled by default. But there's another command we'll just run in a second to see that. And then we have, uh, again, severity of things we need to look at here, uh, whether or not we have 28 resources deployed here. Uh, four of them apparently don't have limits set appropriately. So that's something that, uh, according to the NSA guidance, is, should be applied to all resources. You can define exceptions on resources or on namespaces and so on if, if there are rules you want to look at, but you don't want to apply them to everything. Uh, we'll talk a little bit in a second about um, how we visualize and, and scan these things. But uh, we'll move on here to what it looks like with the host sensor enabled. So we've run an agent on every node. It runs as a daemon set. It starts something up which is able to look at the configuration of things like the kubelet. And then once the scan is finished, it shuts itself off again, deletes the uh, daemon set and the namespace. And so those things that were critically important um uh derek i'll take that one at the end we are looking at fixing that up um all right so i'll try not to look at those before i just throw my train of thought off sorry um we are scanning here against these controls in the nsa framework and we effectively can calculate things down to a number there are cases where you might say, well, if something is a particularly low risk, just in terms of how many things it's applied to or so on, then we don't need to worry about it, but multiply things, criticality and number of resources they run against and so on. 
you could, if you wanted to, use this as a gating procedure to say, if a thing I'm going to deploy to my cluster is going to push my risk score over something that I agree is a problem, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that happen. So it's possible to use this in CI, which I think we should look at momentarily. I do that. The Cubescape command line tool can scan clusters. It can scan local YAML files. It can scan YAML files in Git repositories. It can scan Helm charts. It can render them and say, oh, this is what's going to happen. And alongside all of that, uh, which we'll see if we run a live demonstration, uh, each control comes with remediation instructions. Basically says, this is the thing that we need to fix. And then you can go through and not only see what we need to fix, but you can see where it is in each particular object that you would need to make that fix. And some of those things we can automate and some of them are working more on the automation as to what that will look like. Cubescape runs, it uh, checks it has the latest uh, control library. We talked about controls, but they are written in the open policy agent tool set and it's language called Rego. Uh, Rego is a language kind of like SQL is to C to some degree. Like it, it is not something that people necessarily understand straight away, but it's a, a, a data management language rather than an imperative programming language. But it does make sense for this case and it does sort of open compatibility up to a lot of different things in the open policy agent ecosystem. So we take that in and we scan those snippets against whichever objects we want to look at. Uh, the output we saw there was to the terminal. We can get output in a bunch of different file formats locally that make sense to us, or we can submit that to a third party or a backend service. So we run the service called Armo Platform. This is a service that you can sign up for free and run up 10 nodes on. And if you decide you like it and you wanna run things larger on, uh, you can pay us a little bit of money for the privilege if you wish. We are going to open source this. So we're in the process now of taking the integrations we have with uh, our own sort of SaaS backend and so on and getting that ready so that it'll be available for everyone to run in their own cluster. So all of these things will make sense and you'll be able to do submission to your own environment. But right now, some of the stuff is still tied up with uh, the thing which, which we currently run. So again, if you do a scan and you put dash dash submit and then you give your account ID, so on, uh, you can submit something to Armour. And then that is the uh, dashboard, which we'll talk a little bit about the things we can do there later on as well. But we can look at uh, controls and configurations against the clusters that we have installed. And then it can also look at our vulnerabilities in our clusters. Look at the uh, role-based access control. Uh, just see, I think that's, that's coming out. Uh, and then do scanning against Git repositories and container registries. Something else that uh, we see makes sense to do with this is to install components in your cluster so that it does the scan regularly. So that it's always looking at the controls here. So you can see as things come and go over time as they're deployed, uh, it's effectively, because this is a Docker desktop cluster, it spends a large amount of its time being turned off. And you can see there's, there's no risk at that point in time, which is wonderful. But uh, the, the various numbers of things that have vulnerabilities there come and go as deployments move and change. And so how does that work? Well, we deploy with a Helm chart, the Cubescape components into the cluster. A microservice there effectively does the same thing as the command line tool. It runs against the control library, scans the things that are running inside the cluster. And it also has a vulnerability scanning engine. We use the Gripe engine from Anchor to do container scanning. And you can scan all the containers that are being instantiated or that are part of your part of your deployment manifests. But you can also, from the platform, send an instruction to say, I'm going to scan this repository. I have a, an internal or a public repository that matters to me. And it can enumerate all of the containers there, pull them down, see what the status is, and then report that back to the, the backend platform as well. Uh, you can also get all of this out in Prometheus format and check it against the Grafana dashboard if you want to, if you're not interested in the backend service at that point. And then we get a whole bunch of lovely things which we'll show you when we go to a demo.
We have a visualizer for role-based access control. This is a thing that trips up a lot of people in terms of Kubernetes security. It's uh, having accounts that have permission to do things that they shouldn't necessarily be able to do. I'm not sure whether the resolution's high enough that you can see what's happening there, but uh, we have a Kubescape namespace, which is these components that are installed inside the cluster I was talking about before. And in order to be able to deploy the host scanner, it needs to be able to create a namespace and then deploy a daemon set. So um, we have, sorry, I can't easily move the mouse to the right place, but uh, just an inside the box there at the bottom left, uh, you can see that there's a service account and then that maps against the, sorry, the account maps against the namespace and says that it has permission there to uh, create namespaces. The account in the Kubescape namespace, it's allowed to manage the host provider name and set. We can run the uh, Kubescape command line tool against files. So let's say we have a directory of files locally that we're working on. We can get similar output to what we saw before. And we can use that mode to do a whole bunch of cool integrations. So there is a GitHub action for doing Kubescape, such that when you submit something that you're trying to change, uh, add, in this case, a security context to allow something to run as root just to arbitrarily fix a problem, you submit that, and if the GitHub action is enabled, it will say, hey, that's a non-root container. We've defined that you don't want to do that. And this is something that you can run against the default profiles, the NSA and so on, but uh, this might be a, a company policy thing where you say, hey, I'm going to deploy things in a certain way and I'm going to allow this in certain namespaces and not in others. And uh, I want to, to manage things against the set of rules which you've defined for your own company. And moving even further left, we take the same thing with a Visual Studio Code extension. So we are able to run same kind of stuff as we had there in GitHub. We take a spec that we're working on locally, and then we see all of the recommendations in line and actually flags them at the place in the file that they are causing a problem. Um, give me two seconds, I'll see. I'll find the mouse at least to see if I can bring up a terminal and share that. Do a little demo. May not even let me move it off the screen. All right, so this is one of those, that's why we plan things beforehand moments. I may not be able to get that going straight away, so I'll just go back to the slides and then we'll have another go at that when we're doing questions at the end. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so this is a project that was uh, built from the beginning to be open source. There is uh, there are a number of big cloud security vendors out there. Most of them will look at cloud and sort of do Kubernetes as an afterthought and possibly do open source as an afterthought and so on. But uh, our goal was to be that for the CNCF community for the cloud native user base and to build tooling that would make sense for everybody, starting out with the things that we've looked at so far. So in the whole outrun, the bear theory, we're saying, well, these are the things that are going to give us the most value up front. We're going to look overall about how we can bring runtime stuff in later on. We're going to look at uh, what makes sense to do to extend support for software supply chain and so on. But we did our own survey last year and we found that most people doing open source security, are, are they're either using six or seven different open source tools and trying to glom them together and not necessarily having a great time with the integrations there, or they're using something commercial and they don't quite know what's going on. So we had an opportunity to build something that was designed from the ground up to be open source, to be a community project. And to that end, we've done all the changes required to separate it from our most commercial business and make it a CNCF project. So that was uh, done in December and uh, we published that in January puts us 
here in the, the CNCF landscape, there are a whole bunch of these different tools that we've talked about here. Uh, Cubescape had second in terms of GitHub stars here behind the Cert Manager project, started uh, by my friend James. But uh, there are a lot of different things to, to think about and to worry about. And so our goal eventually is to look at where it makes sense to partner with some of these things. So Tetragon, for example, is uh, part of the Cilium project. They have uh, eBPF tooling for analyzing what's going on at the moment. We're looking at building out uh, ways of prioritizing vulnerabilities by looking at what's running inside a cluster, inside a container, sorry, and saying, all right, well, hey, there's a vulnerability that says this particular file on your image can be exploited if someone gets to it locally. But ultimately, we think there's no chance that's going to happen, or a very low chance, I should say, that that's going to happen because it's part of the build process for a different package or so on. Like, it, it is not going to be a thing which can be exploited because we've watched the container for a period. It hasn't run that. So anyone who is able to get access to that container, they may as well just download something they're going to be able to run. That's something you don't need to worry about. So it's not, don't count it out, obviously, but in terms of the things you need to prioritize first to outrun the bear, it's definitely not on that list. And so that's something that we're looking at building out at the moment. But we're coming at this from a community angle and saying, well, what are the places where all these projects excel and where are the things we can take from them? So eBPF, we've got Falco and Tetragon and so on. Uh, there are a number of different uh, tools here in terms of uh, supply chain tooling and so on. Most of that's also now on the SIGStore project, which is a separate foundation to the CNCF sort of in parallel. But we're building this out to a point where we want to see people be able to use it as a way of visualizing the security status of their Kubernetes environment and handling everything that they need to worry about around place. I mentioned there the uh, supply chain validation and, and so on. The, the other thing we want to do with the eBPF is generate security policies based on application behavior. So if we have clusters that have applications that are allowed to speak to each other, so in your staging environment, you might say, well, this service is allowed to talk to that one. And then you can codify that in policy and say, well, the service can only talk to that one. The example we always give is if someone's able to send a malformed image to a service that exists to resize images, and there are a lot of cases, uh, big iPhone hacks and so on, where by embedding a PNG and a JPEG and a PDF, they manage to uh, confuse the image library and uh, cause it to execute arbitrary code. In the case that that happens, we don't want people to be able to escape out of that container effectively. We want to, to limit them and say, there's no reason why the image resizing service should ever be able to talk to the payment service or the database or anything like that. It should talk to uh, the front end and the thing that sends it to images to resize, and that's the only thing we should be able to do. So we not only want to be able to handle the fact that the people don't People, people should know up front all these connections that are going to happen, but they don't bother doing it. So we, we really do want to be able to say, well, this is what was happening in your actual environment and then be able to apply those based on that application behavior. We did uh, something cool recently because uh, everybody is doing it and uh, played around with uh, chat GPT. Uh, it didn't try and take even anything over as far as we could tell or express its love and feelings for us. But uh, what it does allow us to do is help write code very well, in the same way that uh, the GitHub Copilot does that. We've taught it how to write controls for Kubescape. So if we want to do validation that says you cannot run a certain thing, or if you want to say only on Wednesdays can you deploy something that's uh, colored green or anything like that, we want people to be able to describe that in human language and then turn that into rego code. And so we have a, a labs feature at the moment where people are able to do that. And We've had a few people ask us about the idea of using Kubescape and its library for admission control. That's for when you want to deploy something to your cluster, have it call out to something that says, all right, can this thing run or not? And we, we have the two sets of opinion on whether or not it's a good thing to do that. The first is basically, yeah, I want that for security purposes. But the second is it takes an awful long time having to call out to a single point of failure and, and having things not deploy with if that service isn't available doesn't let people move and deploy as quickly as they want to. So there's a new alpha feature in Kubernetes 126, which uh, has basically builds an emission controller in using a, a different language to Rego, using uh, Google's common expression language. But we're looking at how we can take our library of controls and effectively rewrite them or compile them down into that and use it to build a, an emission controller that runs inside the API server so that you're able to do those things as quickly as you were able to previously deploy pods. 
And we'll have a uh, blog post coming out on the Kubernetes blog about that in a couple of weeks, all going well. Other things we're working on for uh, 2023. Uh, I mentioned there, obviously, that we run a SaaS service with this backend and UI, free for up to 10 nodes. But we want people to be able to take that and run it themselves. We want this to be something that uh, becomes the standard and the entire platform, the promises that it will be open sourced. So we're in the process of doing that. We want to tie together a few of the, the things that we mentioned there of being able to scan things inside registries and then relate them back to containers we've built from them and then also relate them to running instances inside a cluster. So the whole experience from ID to production. We have all the pieces there, but a lot of it is being able to work backwards and say, well, if, if a vulnerability or a problem is detected in your environment, uh, then you need to find the place where it's deployed. You can't just fix it on the cluster. You want to fix it where it is, and that might be in your GitOps environment, some Helm or Argo deployment, for example. And so we need to help people remediate those things and figure out what the service, that the, the deployment service that was used to deploy these things is. So we're working on how to find that. It's very hard when you lose a lot of data along the way, especially when you're doing templating stuff. We're building out uh, cluster-specific benchmark support. So we mentioned we've got EKS just launched and we'll have the other two come up soon. And uh, bring, being that I'm looking after uh, community and uh, developer relations and so on, documentation is the thing that I found when I joined is, is severely lacking. And so that's something that uh, we have a, a big push in the next quarter to actually bring that up to date and get to the point where it's all available and documented. You can see, and I say I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to, to do a live demo, but um, you can see, obviously, when you click through each control, it links you back to information about the remediation and so on. And so we can look to uh, how we can improve all of that. All right. So there were a couple of questions I saw pop up through chat. Um, I put them in the uh, more difficult question. So um, why why is it not available why is it not available open source yet currently? Is it hard enough to self-host that you're hoping to drive cloud usage? Uh, it's not. It is a sort of a pivot story, effectively. Like the product that Armo was building beforehand was based on technology that the founders developed was focused more about runtime security. And in the process of building that out, they found that basically people weren't ready to do that yet, and they were having trouble with a lot of the Kubernetes stuff further on. And the thing that got built as a proof of concept to help that out ended up being the thing that we decided to focus on. So a lot of the backend is based around sort of a V1 product, which isn't there. So a lot of that is being ripped out and made sensible for people to deploy locally. And it also it's the difference between having a product that was built from the ground up to be multi-tenant and, and run as a SaaS versus something that people run locally. So it does depend on some third-party services for user authentication, for example. So those are commercial things that people won't need, we don't want people to need to run and can't expect people to need to run to run their own version, so we're building those things out. Uh, the brew install Cubescape question was uh, basically, can I install this with Homebrew and why Why can't I do that? I've reported that same bug together. Uh, it is a complicated library question. Uh, there is a native Go library for doing Git processing, and that's very slow, and there is a library written in C for doing Git processing, and that's fast, but if you include that, then uh, you are stuck in a version dependency problem that uh, the homebrew people don't like. So we've actually changed the way that uh, Cubescape works. So if you run the uh, console locally, it'll say whether it's the Git enabled version or not, and whether it's built with that uh, C dependency. Uh, if it isn't, then that will enable us to get that fixed in the homebrew repo, and hopefully we'll have that done in a couple of weeks. Okay, so uh, I encourage everyone now to sort of um, pop back into face mode and talking mode and so on. If there's any uh, questions, uh, I will try and find a sensible way to share my screen in the meantime and see if we can't do something live. Thanks, Craig. Any questions? From humans and or dogs, I, I don't think it, uh, it matters at this point. Craig, you were showing the your VS Code IDE. Was that mm -hmm. interpreting your YAML as you were writing it, and it was analyzing that, uh, or was, did you have to run a scan after you 
had saved a file or what it, was that representing? It can scan on save. Like that's the general way that it works. So you can instantiate okay. one whenever you want, but um, when you save the file, it scans it locally. It's the standard thing. Gotcha. It is comically hard to uh, cause a full screen Chrome window to okay. resize to the point we can move it to where we want it to be. KC. Hey, thank you. Um, so my organization does use Kubernetes as much I personally would like to, um, you know, just doing projects as such. Um, I was looking at a couple different certs for Kubernetes and I was just wondering who you'd recommend or your preferred platform for prepping for certification or if anyone else wants to answer that. The CNCF have their own process for this. Uh, the Linux Foundation wants to make money and so they sell access to this. There are a set of training vendors and so on who would like to try and sell you access to their courses. So yes, there is a, a cottage industry in this kind of stuff. Uh, I think that that like there's no other third party there's no uh like i'm just trying to think like the, the a plus sort of certification industry or so on that there's no one else who's certifying people to a point when you get third party software so i, I worked a lot to with uh, with istio as i said before uh, there was not yet a standard body to do that kind of thing so there were a couple of different vendors who were doing sort of vendor sponsored istio certification but now that's become a cncf project they're starting to roll that into one to sort of unifying it together so Generically for Kubernetes stuff, that's I would just go with the CNCF route, but there are probably a bunch of like people's courses and things that you can look to buy if you want. Separately from the Oh, I meant what I meant was um yes, yeah, so in taking the like the CKS or the CKA, okay. um something like that. So taking certification, is there like a like a teacher or someone like that, like on Udemy or one of these other sites that you know, you'd recommend, so it's like for AWS, you know, everyone has their preferred, you know, instructor or whoever it may be. Is there like a preferred instructor that other people have taken that they've enjoyed for um, CKS or CKA? Yeah. Kim. Apparently Kim's really good. Uh, I'm going to open that up to the group because uh, I... I've worked on this since before all this stuff existed, and so I'm not 100% sure how I would go about learning it from scratch today. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that uh, on Udemy as well, but I don't. That's a very good question, Casey. I don't. I don't think we have any any real. I I, I don't know how many people have actually done that certification, uh, pursued it. Um, but that's a good question. So, um, anybody else have any responses? You stumped us. So, is anyone here CKA or CKS certified or anything like that? Yeah, I am. Uh, you, if you have Cloud Guru, they have some courses on there, uh, Udemy, uh, et cetera. So, if you ever want to meander with there, I also I work at SUSE, so we have a, a a product called Rancher. So, if you don't want to have to mess with a, a Kubernetes cluster from, you know just the command line, go ahead and take a look at that product. So that's something okay. to look at if you want to learn Kubernetes, in my opinion. Yep. Yeah, I've been playing with them a bit, like on with AWS, and I have a Cloud Guru, Udemy, and Pluralsight uh, through work. And so I like the, in, like the depth of some of the Udemy instructors, but I like the environment of a Cloud Guru just because you can have a lot more tools with you know, testing and everything. But um, anyhow, like I said, my place doesn't use as much Kubernetes, but, you know, who knows how long we'll be there for. And so, you know, looking forward like two years down the road, you know, I want to kind of be ready for something like that and just kind of prep in that sense. So anyhow, thank you. There are a whole bunch of um, YouTubers, basically, who are doing courses on various things, as, and some of them try and monetize a bit, but uh, there's like versus trying to learn something before like pre-internet like th there's a embarrassment of options i feel so yes i it's a hard one to know which of the right ones are but uh, get some good recommendations come through in the chat hey what one thing i i run the devops utah feed up group and this is a this is a common request that 
people coming in that kind of new to DevOps and they want to learn, learn Kubernetes. We thought of like doing some workshops uh, as part of our meetup for people that we can do some hands-on uh, and you know troubleshooting type of problems that maybe you don't really have access access to in a course. So those are some things. If if you want to talk with me later or message me, I I would love to get some of those because there's a lot of people who want to learn it but just aren't sure how to start and. Kubernetes is pretty, you know, setting up a cluster is one of the harder parts, right? If if you don't know what you're doing, it can, yeah. it's got lots. Yeah, I of run things. the I run the Utah AWS group meetup group, and yeah. we have a lot of members who are wanting to do the, you know, like using AWS with Kubernetes. And so we've had a presentation on it before, but um, these different tools and you know the application outside of just with, using with inside AWS CCP or Azure, you know, um, I feel like a lot of the community wants to learn more, but um, there's a lot of people who are still uh, fairly nascent to all of it. And so anyway, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to know. Yeah, I'd like to collaborate with you more on that because AWS has some, has some, I mean, EKS is a little more difficult than on the Google side. So we're doing that at the state too and running EKS and would be nice to have like a workshop that maybe met once a week with homework assignments and you came back and looked at stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's an amazing idea. We've, we've talked about doing some sort of um, new newbie type stuff for Kubernetes on some of our meetups too. And it's just, it is a, it's like you say, it's almost something that has to be a very, you know, week to week type thing, you know, a real course to, to get it because those are, us that have been around uh, Kubernetes for so many years that you get to, to the point where you think, well, wait a second, I guess that is kind of an interesting new thing, or, you know, it's, maybe it's a little bit different. Uh, so, um, yeah. Brett. People are making the thing, like the goal was always that you shouldn't have to worry about the differences between the, the thing underneath it. So in large part, the story is, hey, just ask the cloud to give you some disks and it'll give you... PDs if you're on Google, or it'll give you EBS volumes if you're on Amazon, and so on. Like, is that for the people here who actually used it on more than one cloud? And most of what I've done has been on Google, obviously. Is that the experience you actually have? Do you find that deploying on any Kubernetes of your choice is largely the same? I mean, yeah. it depends on what you're looking for. I mean, mm -hmm. K3S for like lightweight scenarios, like on the edge, obviously, I feel like that's the best way to go. But Mm -hmm. um, I like EKS when I've used I, it. So here's the deal. Yes, at the lowest level of a Kubernetes, like when you're talking about like uh, uh, the structure of the API and what it's designed to do, it's designed to try to abstract as much as possible, um, especially when you're talking about like pods and compute. And like, I think you're right. It's pretty good at that. Um, it's pretty good at like, if you need to do volumes, we'll figure out how to do volumes plug away. Like, don't worry about the network. That's just going to work. Like, don't it. It obviously started to break down first around ingress, right? Because like we all know ingress didn't really was never universal. Um, I've never professionally worked at a company that used Kubernetes where we didn't have the concept of a X Kubernetes cluster where X the company name. Like, sure, there's Kubernetes. And yes, most of your manifests are gonna work the same way, but you're going to expect our cluster to have X, Y, and Z extensions. It's gonna have X, Y, and Z CRDs. Like there's there's always this extra layer of expectation um, that like when you start using it completely serious, like legitimately, like you never can just, I don't think I've ever worked anywhere where I said, well, yeah, we can just take all our manifests and drop them into another cluster. Like no way, there's way too many specifics and and that's fine, right? That's, I think it it's, I, I'm sounding negative, but I think Kune has done a pretty good job about the core complicated parts being well abstracted and replaceable but you always end up building a platform on top of that. And I guess that's what I'm talking about. Like we we may have a, a bunch of Kubernetes clusters at Weave, but there's also the Weave platform on top of there, which takes mm -hmm. Kubernetes promises and extends those to our own conventions. Mm -hmm. So I, don't, I think it's done a good job, but they're never, I don't think they're completely like, you can't just swap them out. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Todd's saying they're the same thing is the, the differences between cloud providers is storage. I think that's, that's very true. Uh, it's, a lot of the stuff I think is, is built around the idea that it runs on a cloud. And even though it is a cloud of its own, like it can, it assumes that you have access to 
magically deploy things locally. So you need to have a bunch of other components and, and back to the landscape slides you see all the time. Like you, you have to have something that handles deploying disks as if it was on a cloud if you're trying to run it on premises. And hopefully when you get past that point that it doesn't matter so much. Um Derek to one of your questions before, like a lot of people are not familiar with the concept of running an application that requires stateful storage. And like if we have something to deploy, we're we're looking at what database makes sense to use for the Cubescape backend running in cluster and saying, well possibly like the, the kind of thing we want to run at planet scale for everybody is not necessarily what people are going to be competent and, and capable of running in their own environment. So we might try and say, well, a single environment usage might want to use Postgres or something like that, which is more in line with what there are good practices for, for people running local storage. So I'm just going to click around a few things and, and show the UI here while uh, we're all chatting, if you want. Um, any other interesting questions? Or I do have a question. Is this scanner um, deployed within the cluster, or is this just going to be interacting with like the cluster through like API calls? Yeah. So this, what I have done here, and again, I've, I've deployed this from. Uh, we've actually got a recently published extension for the Docker Desktop tool, and so let's talk about getting similar for Rancher. But um, the the deployment basically it gets you to install a Helm chart in your cluster. And that deploys those components that I saw before. And so this is going to do regular scans and it's going to update the results. It's not necessarily a sensible thing to show you with the, the data that I have here, but this is basically scan results that are done from a cluster that runs when my laptop is awake and then doesn't run when it's not. And saying effectively the, the risk over time, these results here, are those risk results we saw, uh, they're all quite low. I'm trying to tell them like, well, let's um, not make the graph go all the way up to 100% at this point to so make it easier to see. But you can submit individual scan results and see those, or you can have the in-cluster components do them regularly. Do you, uh, I mean, you talk about remediation or proposes uh, some re remediation. Do you, do you uh, anticipate them automatically being fixed or are there just always too many questions that you can't automatically uh, make the changes? Um, it is, I'm just trying to look for one that makes sense to, to show you a remediation on at the moment. Like, um, some of them are excluded here. You see, this is exclusions about, um, the proxy components and the things that are run inside the cluster and cube system. You don't worry about those, but, um, I should be able to say, all right, well, of the resources that failed, uh, how do we go about fixing those? And, um, I'm not actually seeing. I should look at one that um, the bunch that need fixing, uh, but yeah, there is a. Oh. It, I should be able to get you into a nice little view where I'm able to say, uh, I might not actually have anything deployed on this. I thought I had the um, the other clusters. So this is obviously uh, what preparation for a demo looks like. But uh, yes, you can get to a lovely screen which says like this is the the YAML of your environment, and this is the suggestion that I make about how to fix that. And a thing that we're looking at integrating at the moment is a push button to generate pull request. When I talked about the uh, ID to production thing is like, if we know the repository that's causing these to be deployed, then we could submit a pull request against that and say, this needs to be fixed. Because right now, even if we have access, like we can't write to your cluster, but if we could do that, then we're just going to write something which will be overwritten next time you your deployment system goes and does the right thing. All right. Thank you. I spend most of my time doing console stuff, so I'm not 100% sure where to find the the functionality in, uh, in here. All right, any other questions about security, CNCF, podcasts? Uh, do we have visualization of network policies or connection between services? Uh, not yet. That's something we are looking to build out. We, we don't have the ability to get that information at the moment. Uh, that's a thing we need to capture somehow from every node. So the standard ways of doing that, uh, either something that proxies all the traffic like service mesh or something that runs on each node and takes it out of the kernel using something like eBPF. And so that's the model that we're going for at the moment. So this is using uh, the Berkeley packet uh, filter. Then that's like the, what you're. It will be, on. but it, it okay. isn't yet. I don't think. I don't think okay, cool. have needs that. So. In regards to your runtime security, like what what is setting you guys like apart when the containers in runtime? 
So not a huge amount, obviously, like we haven't focused on runtime yet, I guess okay. more from a compliance point of view, but those are the things that uh, like, as we build that out, I'm looking more to how we can not necessarily reinvent the wheel. Like there are a bunch of people who have runtime components that make sense to look at. How do I take the best data from that and tie it in with this, mix it together and, and make it visible to everybody from the, the same console? Uh, are you supporting to support Calico or any other CNI? Uh, it, it does. It doesn't need to. Like when we talk about using something from Cilium, it doesn't imply that uh, it needs Cilium. It's more just like these are components that, that they've built, which we can deploy. So we will take their libraries and put them into our own agent rather than require you to use a certain CNI agent. Well, I wish, I guess we could do this. I just want to say thank you. You know, do the virtual clap or whatever. But uh, I appreciate the. Uh, Thank you. That's kind. Your your time. Your, Google Meet's got this lovely noise canceling feature, so that um, you say that and I can actually hear it. But <laughs> yeah. A uh, couple but, more questions. A couple more hands have gone up there. Um, I can't see the order of them, but uh, feel free to shout out. I appreciate it, Craig. Thank you. Yeah, very much. So I appreciate you. Uh, in your afternoon in New Zealand, spending some time with us. So. No problem. I hope you all uh, shovel yourself out appropriately at the right time, whether it be tomorrow morning or in a few days or whatever it is. Well, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the recording now and uh, thank you again. All right. Thank you, everybody. Questions. Sorry? Take care, everyone. Yeah. And now for the real questions. That if the you want. <laughs>